So I think all of you are aware, uh, it's official. Uh, last weekend, uh, I became old. <laughs> we had our first grandchild, uh, yeah. For whatever reason, my remote is not working. Just give me a half a second here. I don't want you to miss all the pictures I have of her, which I actually wouldn't do that to you. <laughs> well, I would, but I won't, so. There we go. Anna Rose, yes. So it's official. I am old and I'm about to be broke. So she was born and, and they let the grandparents into the room and I hate to admit this, uh, I didn't know I had this in me, but uh, when, when they said, uh, Rachel and Brad said that we could hold the baby, all four grandparents was, the, was in the room. And I, I exercised a set of reflexes I didn't know I still contained. <laughs> and with a couple of mild hip checks and an extended reach, I snatched the, f I was the first grandparent to hold the baby. <laughs> And, and, and I don't feel the least bit bad about it. That's, that's the thing. I, I didn't know that uh, the whole idea about grandparenting is you just get to do obnoxious things and you're okay with it now. Didn't see that coming at all. Then we went out because we didn't know what the gender was going to be before the baby was born. They didn't know. And so uh, we, we found out it was a girl. And so then after we saw the baby, and, and yes, I did share the baby with the other grandparents in case you're wondering. Uh, we went out to grab a bite to eat, and, uh, and so Sue said, now we have to shop because we know the gender of the baby. So we, we went to a mall, and after the third store, I, I started to lose consciousness. It really was, I was getting faint and weary. I, I, I found a little kiosk in the mall that was showing a Tesla, and I was revived by, by looking at something electronic and luxurious but uh, absolutely beautiful little girl and, and uh, so grateful. Uh, Stephen did a phenomenal job in the message last week. I, I live streamed in and just did a great, great job. So grateful to have staff like that. Uh, we're continuing on our series of, of common challenges for our lives and we're kind of examining the life of David because there's such incredible vast amounts of information of his life, almost more than any other Old Testament character. And uh, today we're going to look at the issue of temptation because every single one of us has faced and will continue to face things that are tempting in our lives. And so what are good and healthy ways to respond to them? And we are in uh, 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 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter. And it says, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army, and they destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, and David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed, walked around on the roof of the palace, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to find out about her, and the man said she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. And then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. So David sent this word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. And then David said to Uriah, go down to your house, wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. David was told Uriah did not go home, so he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why don't you go home? And Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my commander Joab and my lord's men are camped in the open country, how could I go to my house, eat and drink, make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, uh, stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next, and at David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. 
But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among the master's servants. He did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. If you don't know the outcome of this story, that's exactly what happened. Uh, David, the fighter of giants, the singer and writer of songs, the, the person who we have really been impressed by all the things that he has done in his life, now is in a situation that we are absolutely stunned by. The, there's two names that seem forever linked to David's life. And even if you don't know much about Scripture or the stories of Scripture, you're probably familiar with both of these names. And one of them is Goliath. And it is this menacing, terrifying military giant that liked to trash talk and dominate battlefields. And the other main person in David's life is Bathsheba. And uh, she couldn't be more opposite of an intimidating giant. She is a beautiful woman. And she winds up becoming a victim of an abuse of power that David is exercising. And uh, if we were uh, seeing this lived out today, which we are, uh, over and over again in the headlines of our newspapers and our newscasts, uh, there would be a scandal, there would be lots of reporters, and there would be a call for, for David to abdicate his throne. Um, this is what was going on. And so what, how did this start is, is David has, has sent his uh, military fighters onto a battle. Usually he would accompany them. He chose not to do that this time. At this stage in his life, he's at the height of his popularity and his power. He has nothing left to prove to anyone. He's universally loved, universally followed. No, there's no challenge to the throne. So he doesn't feel like he has to go out to battle to prove himself. And, and uh, he's a little bit restless. Uh, the, the Bible says that he gets up at night from his bed and he goes out to the roof where it obviously would be cooler and he's walking around on the roof of his palace which is big enough and tall enough to give him line of sight to lots of his neighbors and he spots one of them and he notices a woman bathing and uh, the Bible says she's exceedingly beautiful. And so David sent one of his servants uh, to find out who this woman was and this servant seems to have an inclination as to what David is doing and why he is doing it because the information that comes back is not just a name and an address. The information that comes back is this is Bathsheba and she is the daughter of and she is the wife of and fills in the names. This is not, that's Bathsheba. This person is reminding the king she's somebody's daughter, she's somebody's wife and it doesn't even slow David down. Now he sends more than one person. He sends messengers, and he sends for them to bring Bathsheba back to the palace. And uh, she comes back, and the language is subtle, but it's significant. And what it says is in the, in the uh, translation we looked at, it said that he slept with her. Other translations say that he lay with her. It's not the language that's ever used in Scripture for intimacy between a husband and wife. There's other words that are used for that. This isn't love. It's lust, and it's a display of David fulfilling his lust by using his power. So Bathsheba goes home, and David thinks everything is fine. He got what he want. He's in control of all things, and then he receives a message. Bathsheba sends a message back to him and says that she's pregnant. So David goes into problem-solving mode. If you're king for very long, you learn to solve problems, and he's going to solve this problem. And so he sends for Uriah, who's out in the military battle, to come home for a little R&R &R &R with the assumption that he will go in and spend time with his wife, and then everyone will automatically assume that this child that she is carrying would be her husband's. And so... He brings Uriah in, and Uriah comes and gives information to the king about the state of the conflict, the military conflict, but he actually doesn't go home. He leaves the palace, or it looks like he's leaving the palace, and he stays on the porch and sleeps with the servants. And when he's asked why he didn't go home, he said, it just didn't feel right to me because my fellow soldiers are living in danger, and there's nothing easy about their life right now, and for me to go and enjoy myself just seems wrong. 
And so David goes, well, that didn't work, plan B. And plan B was, is he invites Uriah to dinner the next night, and he actually gets him drunk because it is historically true that alcohol tends to weaken the resolve of any person. And so he just figures, if I get him drunk enough, he will go home. And he doesn't go home. He spends another night on the palace porch. And so he comes back. David finds out. And now it's plan C. And he sends Uriah back into the field of combat with a letter that he knew Uriah would never open. That's how trustworthy this guy is. He sends a letter with the death orders for the man who carries it and trusts that he will never sneak a peek to find out what's inside of it. And the letter is addressed to Joab, the general of the military campaign, and he said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to put Uriah on the front lines in the fiercest fight that's going on. I want you to have a secret signal that everybody knows except Uriah. And when you give it, I want them to withdraw. I want you to abandon him on the field of battle, and I want him to die. It's just unbelievable. And it happened. And the question is, who is this David? Because this is nothing like the guy we've been reading about. This is the seventh week in the series, and this could easily be week 14. And we don't have any indication that he's like this. How did he get to such a place in his life? And the answer is simply this. David's story illustrates that most sin happens gradually. He didn't fall off a cliff. This is not a sudden thing. There's a whole series of steps associated with this sin journey that David is on. And actually, there's a word attached in the passage that we just read that is connected to every single sin step that he takes. It, it seems like just a verb that has no moral content to it whatsoever, but the single word is attached to every step that, that David takes on his sin journey, and the word is sent. Sent. Every time you see that word, something is happening, and David is taking another step further down the path of sin. David sent his general and his military into a fight without him. David sent a servant to get information about who the woman he saw from his palace, Ruth. And then he sent messengers to have her invited and escorted back to him. And he keeps escalating the misuse of his power. And then he sent for Uriah to come back to him. And then he sent Uriah back into battle, and he sent a letter to go to Joab. And, the, and, and then he sent for Bathsheba to come back and to be his wife after Uriah has died. It's just constant, constant steps being taken, and the clue is every time you see the word sent, there's actually two other occasions where the word is used in this passage that it wasn't David sending, but something being sent back to him. And the first was when Bathsheba sent word to him that she was pregnant. This was uncalculated. He, he didn't think that this was going to happen. And so he's surprised by this piece of information. The other thing is that when, when Joab, the general, sent word back that Uriah was dead, things did not go as originally planned. And so more people died in that excursion than just Uriah, and some valuable military assets had been lost. And so uh, Joab knew that this was going to anger David, and he's, he told the messenger, he said, if, if David starts getting angry about the loss that we took, just make sure he knows Uriah was among the people who died, and he'll be fine. This is absolutely fascinating. Joab has already figured out what's going on here. He's a cunning individual, and he knows what's happening. And beyond that, he's actually using that piece of information to cover his backside on what was a military failure, and he's perfectly fine doing it, and David can't say anything about it because this is where the sin journey takes us. And then there's one final scent. It's in chapter 12. God sent Nathan, the prophet, to David. David's delusion of playing God with people's lives is about to be over because there is only one God, and it wasn't David. So there are countless stories in our world and countless sin journeys, and after a while, they just start sounding alike. Like, I don't know about you, but it just feels like 
I'm constantly confronted in the news with stories that sound like the last story I heard. It's just the names have been changed, not to protect the innocent, but actually to expose the guilty. The details of our own sin journeys might seem a little bit different, but there are some universal truths within them. And what I want you to see is that the first truth is this. Sin occurs when we want to be God. It actually was the first temptation, right? The, the serpent comes to Eve in the garden and says, if you eat of this fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the one that God says you can't eat, you will be like him. This desire that we have to be like God, to play God. Uh, we want something. We want someone. We want to take charge of our restless lives. We want to assert control over a situation or someone else. And this story reminds us, when we read this story, it reminds us, we are all sinners. And until we recognize that we are all sinners, we will have no use for the gospel. If we're not sinners, we don't need the gospel. And that's why these stories are so powerful and important for us in Scripture. So Nathan is a prophet. He's a person who's sensitive to the voice of God, and he's going to be obedient and going, but he knows this is risky. David is the second king of Israel, and the first king of Israel, who was Saul, actually had a number of priests killed just because they acted in ways that didn't please him. And so Nathan knows if this guy is following the last guy, I could be at risk. And so he tells the king a story. And this is fascinating to me. He never mentions God one time in his story, and he never demands that David repent one time in his story. This guy is really good at his job. I mean, it's, it's really, just think about this. What would you think if you came in here today and I just told you a story, oh, let's say about grandkids, and, uh, and never mention God and never mention anything about repentance or the gospel or anything, and just, well, thank you all for coming today. How would you feel? And you would, you would probably start thinking after a while, uh, this guy needs to crack the Bible and start talking about something that matters. Well, he tells a story, and the story is, is, is a really intriguing one. He tells a story about a very wealthy man who owned lots of property, had lots of herds and lots of flocks, lots of sheep. And a friend of his had visited him, and so he was going to have a banquet in honor of this friend. And obviously, you would take a lamb, and you would slay it, and you would prepare it for the banquet that was about to happen. But the wealthy man does not use one of his lambs. He has a neighbor who's a very poor person, and this person actually doesn't have hardly any property and doesn't have any flocks or any herds. He only has one animal, and it's not for economic gain. It's more of the family pet. It's one little lamb. That's all he's got. The, the, the Bible actually tells in the story that this guy lets his little lamb eat at the same table, even lets him drink out of his same cup. That's how much he loves this little lamb. And this wealthy guy goes to the poor guy, and he takes that lamb, and he kills that lamb, and he serves up that lamb to his guests. And David, when he's listening to the story, is outraged. I mean, he's... How could a guy do something like that? Like some of you are already getting a little annoyed. Some of you got annoyed when you found out that David, uh, that this man was letting him eat at the same table and drink from his cup. And some of us go, yeah, yeah, yeah you can't do that. But the rest of us got outraged when, when he took that lamb. And this is what David actually said. As the Lord lives. You hear, I love <laughs> now God comes into it. As the Lord lives, the man who's done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing, and he had no pity. And then Nathan simply responds, it's you. You're the one. You're the man who did this. And the gospel, I mean, it stuns David. And this is really important to us. The gospel deals with us. With us. We always think that, that God should be confronting and dealing with other people for the things that they do that annoy us and embarrass us. God insists this isn't all about somebody else. The gospel deals with you. It doesn't deal with vague generalizations. It's not about ranting opinions or religious indignation. David thinks the story is about somebody else, and he gets all worked up. And what Scripture reveals to us is when we get worked up like that, that is worthless religion. It is useless. 
It's the religion of judgmentalism. It's the religion of finger pointing. It's the religion of name calling, the religion of accusing, the religion of blaming. And with every word in Nathan's story, David is feeling more religious. He feels pity and he feels judgmental. And what you need to know is those two things are the poison we drink that makes us feel superior to other people. Because when you feel pity and you feel judgmental, you feel better, but you don't make anything else better. We don't change our world when we feel superior to other people. We just look down on them. And God's word says that's worthless religion. So he's becoming, David's becoming more religious by the minute. And he's weighing in and he's making his judgments. And then the gospel comes crashing in. It's you. And that's the moment. Like, how is David going to respond? Because he can order the death of this prophet. He can justify and rationalize. He can come up with all kinds of things. He's the king. He's in control. And in that moment, he gets it right. And his response is, is as simple as you can possibly imagine. He says, I have sinned against the Lord. He just acknowledges it. He just confesses it. He, he focuses on his position before God rather than someone else's position before God. And he knows he's in trouble and he knows he needs help. Until we recognize our sin, we cannot respond to God who has come to rescue us. We have to recognize our own sin. In this world, you can't actually avoid sin. I know sometimes in religious cultures we try to do this, right? We try to make the culture such that there's nothing in it that would tempt us in any way. But that's not a realistic goal. We're never going to create a world where there's nothing that will tempt us. you got to get to heaven to get there. So Scripture doesn't say the goal is to eliminate temptation. Scripture says the goal is to recognize sin and particularly to be good at recognizing it in ourselves, not someone else. Facing your own sin will require you to abandon your own God illusions. I'm not as good as I think I am. I'm not as great as I think I am. And that would be terrifying to abandon those illusions if it were not for stories like this. This is what helps us. The God story intersects the David story. And when that happens, this things like guilt and shame, which have unbelievable gravitational pulls on our lives. They begin to disintegrate under the power of things like grace and mercy and forgiveness. Those things, the grace, mercy, and forgiveness begin to disintegrate the power of guilt and shame in our lives. And so we discover that when sin is taken away, we're actually not less. We're actually made more. This is a really big, important step for us to understand in our spiritual journey. Once you know the God story, and once you discover your own sinfulness, it actually has this profound effect on us. Instead of being hopeless, we actually become brave. Instead of trying to hide things, we actually become honest. Instead of keeping things in the dark, we're willing to bring them to the light because we see that the grace of God not only brings forgiveness of those things, but transforms our life in the process and frees us from our own God illusions. We're encouraged to do those things. Now, when we think about sin, we usually think about some rule that's being broken. And certainly that's included, but that's not all sin is. Sin actually has, it's, it's more about describing our innate tendency to either avoid God or to play God. Anytime we're trying to avoid God, anytime we're trying to play God, whatever action follows that is going to be sinful. The more we focus on God, the less likely we are to play God. So here's the horrifying and terrible truth about sin. Sin actually doesn't feel like sin when you're doing it. It doesn't. It feels godlike. See, David? David didn't feel like a sinner when he brings Bathsheba to his bed. He feels like a lover. And he didn't feel like a sinner when he sent Uriah to his death. He felt like a king. He thinks he's in control. And he thinks he's, he can get away with it. Our sinful nature is not that we desire too much. It's that we settle for too little. 
There are things that God wants for our lives that we forfeit because we settle for much less than he intended. So sinning actually doesn't take a lot of imagination. I think it's forgiveness and salvation and grace that takes a lot of imagination because the Bible says that they are fresh and they are new and they are original every time they show up in our lives. Great passage from Scripture. Lamentations 3, it's the prophet Jeremiah, and this is what he says. This is what I call to mind, and therefore I have, what's the next word? Hope. It's so important when dealing with our own sin stories. This is what I call to mind. This is the reason I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Would you read this last sentence with me? They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Let's bow our heads this morning. I'm actually going to call an audible on our worship team this morning. And uh, there's an old, old chorus in the church, so old that probably none of us know it anymore. But it actually contains those words in it. I think we'll try to sing that before we leave today. But here's what I want you to hear from me today. Stop trying to control the outcome of the information that makes you look less and start reaching for the God who insists that you are more. We have listened to lesser voices, including our own. And we have settled for things that are so much less than God ever intended for us. And the gospel comes crashing into our lives. And the gospel does not come to tell us how bad someone else is. The gospel doesn't come to tell us how much sin there is in someone else's life. The gospel confronts us with our own brokenness and our own selfishness, but not in a way that it's a heavy hand of judgment from the wrath of God coming down upon us to destroy us. The gentle word of God comes in. And he says, your acknowledgement of your sin is all that I need to release mercy and grace and forgiveness that's as fresh as every single sunrise that ever comes into our lives. So Father, help us. We, we are a sinful people. You are a righteous God. And you have found a way to reach us today. In Jesus' name. You, you can remain seated for this. But uh, if you don't know the song, let's sing it at least a couple of times. Maybe you can learn it along the way. Let's sing this together. You'll sing this steadfast.